Good afternoon, everybody. Unfortunately, the copy machine was out of toner, so I wasn't able to print today's slides. If you'd like a copy of the slides, they're posted online, and so you'll have to print them yourself after class. Um, and actually, that made me wonder about how many of you actually care to keep a copy of the slides. You know, I'm wondering if I'm printing unnecessary copies on the days that I do bring them. So raise your hand if you do prefer to continue having a printed copy of the slides. OK. I'll continue to print them as long as there's toner and paper in the machine. Uh, but unfortunately, today, that wasn't the case. We're going to have a quiz on Thursday. And um, so please be on time Thursday so that you can uh, do the quiz with as much time as you, as you get. I'm actually going to be missing a lunch with uh, the Sheikh on Thursday. He's going to be on campus meeting with new faculty, but I thought, no, I better come to class. So unfortunately, I'm missing a free lunch to be here on Thursday. Yeah. OK, so the next assignment, I've just given you a copy of homework eight. That's due on Sunday. And uh, the majority of the calculations on that assignment, we're going to go over today. And then there's also a few more on Thursday. Um, as a reminder, looking further into the future, part one of your research paper is due on Thursday, the 12th of November. And as a reminder, the way this is going to work is you give me a draft, and then you have a period of about a week, maybe a few days more than a week, to go to the writing center in the library, have an appointment with the tutors there. They'll go through your paper with you and give you suggestions. And uh, then after that first phase, then you'll do the same thing with part two. You'll give me a draft, take that draft to the writing center, have an appointment with them, and then you'll have some extra time to put everything together and do a final revision before the, uh, the overall finished assignment is due. Um, I'll give you some information about the Writing Center a little bit later on. They've, they've put a video on their website that explains the process. It's very easy, it's free, and it can do nothing but help your paper. So it's really great service that they offer over there. Any questions on the announcements? The quiz is going to be focusing on the homework assignment that you submitted and the concepts since the midterm exam. So when it comes to calculations, these are the most recent calculations. And then just um, the ideas, everything since the exam until including today. So just a general refresher may be uh, a good idea. Other questions? All right. Today we're going to be talking about water pollution. And um, it's chapter 7 in your book. One of the first things we need to keep in mind is that the characteristics of water are related to where it comes from. And this is a really nice figure that shows the hydrologic cycle. That is, where water comes from and where it goes as it cycles through the environment. And so the source of all of the water in the atmosphere, the, the great source, is our oceans. And so oceans evaporate water, precipitation, is when that evaporated water then comes, falls back down onto the earth and it can go onto the surface or precipitation can infiltrate into soil. So let's take a look. There's water in lots of different places in this picture. Let's think about the quality of the water and how much pollution it could possibly have in different places on the picture. How much pollution is there when the water is in the air? Okay, what kind of pollution could there be? When there could be acid rain, right. And so sulfur in coal, when it is burned, forms sulfuric acid. And so there are parts of the world where acid rain is a real problem. Thankfully, that's not a, a problem everywhere. And so generally speaking, precipitation water is pretty pure. The water quality at a high mountain lake is also very good. Why do you think the water quality at a high mountain lake would be better than the water quality at a lake in a low-lying area, at a lower elevation? What is it about the high elevation that makes the water quality better? What's that? What do you mean about population? You're right. Can you explain further? Right. 
Right. Okay. So there's people. People is the difference. Up here, you know, it's H2O in both places, right? But up here in the high mountains, there are fewer people that are having their uh, runoff and their waste products compared to the low-lying areas. And so if we compare high mountain lakes versus a low-lying lake, the difference there is just the, the runoff that comes from civilizations in the elevation above the low-lying lake. Groundwater is the water that's flowing through an aquifer. And the sand and the gravel and the dirt acts like a filter, actually. You know, it's very similar. We've talked about a sand filter and how a sand filter works for water treatment. Well, you've got one gigantic sand filter here as the water is straining through that media. And so when you extract water from a well, there's very little turbidity in groundwater. The water is very clear. And the reason why is because of the soil acting as a filter. That's not the case. The water in the lake, the water in a river has high turbidity. And who can uh, refresh our memory on where the turbidity is coming from? Okay, the rain is falling onto the surface. The raindrops disturb the soil, take a little bit of soil with it. And then as the water coalesces into the river, those suspended solids stay suspended because they're just tiny little particles. So turbidity, groundwater under the influence of surface water. So we're here we are at the lake. Remember we said the lake's a little bit polluted. Maybe it has agricultural runoff. Maybe it has factory runoff. Well, groundwater is usually very pure because it's further away from people. But the water that is close to the lake intermingles with the water in the lake itself. And so the groundwater that's close to a lake or a river sometimes is called uh, groundwater under the influence of surface water. And so, for example, if you're putting in a drinking water well, you wouldn't put a drinking water well very close to a highly polluted river because as you're sucking the groundwater out, it could actually draw water from the river itself. Uh, another issue to consider is this is showing evaporation in the lake. And so if there's a lot of evaporation, you can expect there to be higher levels of salinity, like higher mineral content. And one example of that locally here is that we've got lagoons, right? There's the Dubai Creek, there are lagoons in Sharjah, and the salinity is measurably higher in those lagoons than it is in the open ocean because there's an evaporation of water, but the minerals stay behind. So the main point that we drew from the previous slide was that the quality of the water depends on its source. And this table summarizes the difference between groundwater and surface water. Uh, usually in groundwater the composition is constant because it doesn't experience seasonal changes in the same way that we go through the seasons at the surface. And so in each of these different categories there's a pretty big difference between groundwater and surface water and we have to react to those differences when we design treatment. And also, we have to try and preserve the beneficial characteristics of the water where we're drawing it from. Here's another issue that's important in our local area, and that is what happens when you have a coastal region. So here you can see that there is seawater, and we're on the coast, the, the land that's close to seawater. When you have a well and you're sucking the fresh water out of the well, then water has to come towards that well to replace it. Some of the water will come from other areas that have fresh water where the rain was falling, and so this fresh water came from precipitation. But the soil underneath the ocean has saline water in it, salty water, so that if you're sucking water out of a well close to the sea, then the salt water can intrude in what used to actually be fresh water. So you can see the boundary of what used to be previously the normal interface. That's the boundary between the fresh water and the salt water. But because you were sucking water out of this well, that sort of drew the salt water further into the land. And so that leads to brackish water. Now there are other reasons for brackish water besides salt water intrusion, but that is uh, a a problem that's faced by coastal areas where they rely on wells is they'll find out over time their well water is becoming more and more salty as the ocean intrudes. 
So how clean does water have to be? You know, uh, the water that you use to irrigate plants maybe doesn't have to be as clean as the water that we would want to drink from a glass. And drinking water probably doesn't have to be as clean as the water that we put into our veins in an IV. We would want that to be really pure because it's going straight into our blood and it's not being filtered through the stomach first. Uh, you know, all of it is H2O, but we have to consider two things, the constituents that are in it, but then also what is the intended use of the water. And that's a criteria that's used a lot in environmental law. You know, the pollution that is allowed into a water body is uh, judged against what you plan to use that water body for. So, for example, ocean water. How clean does ocean water have to be? Well, that depends on what we're going to do with it. Here in the Emirates, we use ocean water to create, to create uh, drinking water. You know, that's where the water that comes from our tap is coming from ocean water. It goes through the desalination process. In a lot of places, ocean water isn't used as a source of drinking, and so it's considered um, a little bit more acceptable to pollute in those areas. So probably there's a higher standard for keeping the ocean water pure here because we think that's the source of our drinking water. A river should be clean enough for navigation. And think about what are some of the other things that people do on rivers. It might be that there's recreation or fishing. Uh, it could be just for boating traffic. And so all of the things that people intend to do with that water, you have to make it pure enough that it's not interfering with fishing, for example. If you put pollutants into the water that will kill the aquatic life, and that collapses the fishery, then the tourism could be affected, or the ability to generate food could be affected. So each of these has a different water quality standard that depends on what you plan to do with the water. And there's different categories in contamination. There's physical contamination, which would be like the suspended solids. There's chemicals that can be dissolved, and biological pathogens as well. So let's go through some of those categories, and I'd like to show you what standards are. Um, this is where the pollution can come from, and we can divide it into categories of point sources and a non-point source. And this is the different types of things you can expect from each. Let me give you an illustration of what is a point source versus a non-point source. Okay, a point source would be when you have a river and water that's polluted is coming in from a pipe or just at a single location. So it could be sewage discharge, it could be discharge from a factory, and those are considered uh, sources that are concentrated into a single location. By contrast, a non-point source is where the pollution is running over the surface of the land. And so if there was fertilizer over all of the land and then it rains, then that's going to come into the river in lots of different locations. And so that's a non-point source. It's distributed over a, a longer distance. If we were measuring the pollution here in the river on the left, it would be clean water, clean water, clean water, and suddenly we'd experience pollution because it's coming in all at once. What would be the pollution concentration as we're going in this river? Would it be constant? It would, be, it would be zero, as, as we're going downstream, it would be zero, and then when we encounter the pollution, it would be a gradual increase. Because remember, it's spread out over lots of different places, and so by the time we get to here, we've only had one of the arrows. By the time we get to here, now there's two arrows upstream. And so it would be gradually increasing the pollution of whatever this is. It might be bacteria, it could be uh, fertilizer chemicals, and so on. So a point source pollution could be a feedlot or a contaminated stream coming into a larger river. And here's a picture of some crops that are close to a river. And so whatever the farmers are putting under the crops, it's going to get in the river. It's inevitable. We've talked about turbidity previously, and that's the suspended particles that interfere with the passage of light. Color can get into water when organic material like algae or leaves break down, and that leaves behind color. Uh, different chemicals can cause problems with taste and odor, and sometimes those taste and odor problems are considered like a secondary criteria because 
They may not cause actual problems to human health, but it's more of an aesthetic thing that we have to uh, fix the taste and odor problems or else people will be unhappy rather than sick. Still, we need to take care of it. Temperature can be considered a physical characteristic and actually heat can be a pollutant. So think about, go back to the case of a point source. Some places discharge hot water into rivers, like a factory, uh, there's a big aluminum smelter here in the UAE. Uh, there are um, factories in the United States, like, uh, for example, power plants discharge heat. Heat is a waste product from generating power. So why do you think that extra heat in a river could be considered a pollutant? What's that? Okay, that could be it. What do you think? Yeah, that's right. Um, there are fish in the river that are expecting maybe cold water. And you think, well, everybody likes warmer weather, right? Um, some fish, can, they, they need a lot of oxygen. For example, salmon and trout. You've probably eaten salmon before. Salmon require cold water because cold water has more oxygen in it. And so if you have a fish that requires cold water and you discharge heat into the river, then that is forcing oxygen out. It's an unintended byproduct. And so even heat can be considered a pollutant. Um, and so you know, water temperatures can change seasonally, and that affects some of the chemicals that we use when we treat the water. But also we have to think not only what are we doing with the water, but uh, what are some of the other historical uses, like the, uh, the ecological impacts of what could be added. Some inorganic materials, inorganic materials are chemicals that don't have a, ca a carbon-hydrogen bond. So organic means it does have a carbon-hydrogen bond. So you can see in each of these, these are inorganic chemicals that I say are harmless. And I've put that in quotes, harmless, because, you know, everything can be harmful if there's too much of it. You know, salt, we put salt on our food, but if there's too much salt, then it could cause you a lot of problems. And so here's an example, fluoride I say is harmless, but then in a higher concentration, fluoride can cause trouble. And so these are some of the common harmful chemicals, like lead, for example. There's no safe concentration of lead. Arsenic also can cause a lot of uh, problems. So each one of these has different health effects associated with them. Here's a table that explains what are some of the health effects? For example, we have to be careful about lead because if you go over to the column on the right, it causes cancer, kidney, central, and peripheral nervous system effects. That sounds bad. So how much lead is okay? It says here that the goal is there should be zero lead in water. There's two columns here. There's the maximum amount that's allowable and then the goal which is a little bit lower than the maximum amount, what we should actually strive for. So copper, for example. Our goal is that there should be less than 1.3 milligrams per liter of copper. And this column shows some of the treatment technologies that can be used to remove the different pollutants. There can be direct filtration, there can be oxidation, reverse osmosis, ion exchange, and so uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has a list of best available technologies for each one of these pollutants. Organic materials, organic chemicals, can be a lot more deadly. Um, and there are different ways that they affect the body. One of the ways is an acute impact. An acute means something that happens immediately. And an example of an acute effect is uh, if you have 50 milligrams of nicotine per kilogram of body mass, then that would uh, cause death within 30 minutes for 50% of the exposed population. That seems like a strange thing, right? 30 minutes, 50%. Uh, that's called an LD50. It's the lethal dose that will kill 50% of a population. So in the case of nicotine, it's 50 milligrams per kilogram. So that's an acute, something that has an immediate impact. The word chronic, on the other hand, means it's an impact that has to be a very long exposure duration 
before you start to see it. And so there's a gradual and cumulative effect. And an example of chronic exposure to chemicals could be if you have 2.3 liters of water per day over the course of 70 years as one microgram per liter of bromodichloromethane, the risk of cancer is 2.06 times 10 to the minus 7. So less than one in a million. That sounds pretty low, right? Let's all drink that water. Uh, this bromodichloromethane is a disinfection byproduct. Disinfection byproducts is when, I think you had a question related to this on your uh, homework, you know, when chlorine combines with organic material, it can form these disinfection byproducts and they happen to be carcinogenic. They cause cancer. So they've done research with mice and other lab animals and they found out how much of this chemical it takes over a long term to cause an additional risk of cancer. One in a million risk of cancer. No wait, time to 10 to the seventh. Is that uh, one in 10 million? Yeah, I think that's one in 10 million risk of cancer. So here's a list, uh, similar to what we saw before, of lots of different chemicals. The Environmental Protection Agency has many different chemicals they've studied. And based on their study, some of the chemicals they say there should be zero in the water, that's the goal. Other chemicals, they set the goal a little bit higher. And so, if it has a goal of zero, you can assume it's a pretty dangerous chemical. If the, if the allowable dose is a bit higher, then presumably it's less dangerous. What they're trying to do is they're trying to prevent these chronic health effects. Many of them, you can see, the effect is cancer. The more and more chemicals get into our environment, the higher the risk there is of cancer. So we've talked about physical contamination, like heat, suspended solids. We've talked about chemical contamination. There's also microbial pollution. And so that can refer to things like uh, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, elements. I'm going to show you some pictures of each of those. The way that we can deal with that is by separating those things from the water. A membrane could be an example of something that simply separates the clean water from the microorganisms. We can boil, with adding heat will kill the pathogens. We can use a chemical like we've talked, uh, uh, chlorine or hypochlorite. And there's also UV irradiation. The way that we can measure whether or not there is contamination present is uh, you can put a sample of water on an auger plate and then wait for things to grow. It's uh, a method of counting how many of these colonies form and then you know what the concentration of microorganisms per milliliter is by you know, knowing how much of the water you put onto the plate and then you count how many of these colonies formed. And so each one of these represents one bacteria when you first added it. It's a lot more than one bacteria now because each single bacteria has grown into a colony over time. That's one way of trying to quantify how much bacteria pollution there is in water. Another is what they'll do is they'll take a sample of water and they'll mix it with sugar. And so this is a sugar plus water solution and then you put another small little tube in it and if there's bacteria in there, they'll start to use the sugar and then they'll give off CO2. That's what they exhale, is CO2. And so if you collect any gas in the upside down tube, then that tells you that something was in the water, that there was bacteria present to use the sugar. So that's just another way of trying to see if there's bacterial contamination. And there are statistical methods where you can continue to dilute the water You'd use full strength water and then maybe a 10 to 1 dilution, you're diluting it with pure water, 100 to 1 dilution, and then by analyzing how dilute you have to get the sample and how many of these show uh, gas accumulating, you can do what's called a most probable number test. It's just a statistical analysis that tells you what is the concentration of bacteria based on this test. It's really hard to see all of the pathogens that are present in drinking water. 
And so sometimes what we'll do is we'll look for only one of them. You know, there's so many different kinds of viruses and bacteria and rotifers. There's, there's thousands of things that could make us sick. And so instead of looking at everything, what we do is we look for an indicator. And an indicator means if that one's present, probably everything else is too. Or at least there's a risk of everything else. And so one of the indicators that we use is called total coliform. Another is E. coli. And maybe you've heard of these before. E. coli is sometimes what gets into contaminated meat and it makes people sick. But if you're taking a sample of drinking water and you find E. coli, the reason why it's a good indicator that other things are there as well is that E. coli lives in the intestinal tracts of humans and animals. And so it's not just a random bacteria that would be there regardless. You're not going to get false positives with E. coli. If you find E. coli, it means it came from people or animals. Another thing about E. coli is that it is, uh, it's a strong organism. And that's good because um, you wouldn't want to try and use a weak organism as an indicator because maybe the indicator would die before the other things and if you didn't see the indicator it would give you a false sense of security. It would make you think, well I didn't find the indicator so the water must be safe. So you want a strong indicator so that it's the last thing to die because uh, if you want to, to drink the water and it, you think it's clean, you don't want there to be any viruses or or, uh, or bacteria or anything else. And so the characteristics of a good indicator is that it should come from people and animals. It should be strong. Item number three, oh, strong, here we go. Relatively strong organism and uh, does not reproduce in the environment. That's important because you don't want to get false positives. You want to always, when you see the indicator organism, you don't want to dismiss it as something that's just naturally occurring. You want to know that it's from people. And the other thing is it should be easy to measure and easy to grow. And if it was an indicator that is very hard to isolate in the lab, it wouldn't be very useful for us. And so indicator organisms are just a, a way of trying to find the pathogens. And you can measure with a, a machine if there are chemicals, but it's much harder to detect pathogens. There aren't machines that can just, you dip it in the water and it says, yes, bacteria. No such machine exists. Um, and so we have to take a sample of the water and try and grow the bacteria to know. Here's some pictures. This is a picture of a prokaryote, which is uh, the nucleus isn't bound in the membrane. This is a, a bacteria that's uh, spirochetes, causes a lot of illness in the developing world very small. Here's a scanning electron microscope picture of a protozoa that's known as Giardia. And Giardia is found in, um, in streams in nature, mountain streams, and uh, it comes, they sometimes call it, the, the illness that you get from Giardia, they call it beaver fever because beavers are known as carrying Giardia. Have you had Giardia before? Anyone? All right. One of the characteristics of protozoa is they have motility. They use these little arms and legs. They swim around, whereas a bacteria does not have motility. It doesn't have any way of moving about other than just it moves with the flow, whereas protozoa can move under their own power. Rotifers are uh, categories of slightly larger organisms that live in water and sometimes rotifers are considered as uh, a, a primary uh, food source for fish, but they can also uh, they can infect snails that then can infect humans. And so indirectly, rotifers can be pathogenic to us. Uh, here's a picture of nematodes, which are parasitic worms. And uh, there is a real problem with uh, in some of the developing countries of the worms getting into people's stomach and actually they'll come out of their skin when they have uh, contaminated drinking water with these worms. Here's tardigrade, which is sometimes also called a water bear. This is a kind of a, an amazing picture of it. It's a very durable, yeah? 
yeah, the, the water bear is basically indestructible. They, they like to be in water, but you can dry them out and they come back to life when you, you give them water again. Yeah, the, the water bear is very strong. So, looking at disgusting pictures of bacteria, I thought we should look at a nice mountain stream to clear your mind, clear your palate. Oh, that's much better than looking at bacteria, right? Okay. Back to polluted water. Here's a picture of the Ganges in India. Here's the Songhua in China. And if you're seeing uh, garbage in a stream, chances are good that there is runoff from the street going into the river. A lot of times, litter like this will get into a river um, as a result of heavy rains, uh, washing contamination that was in the street and in the gutter through the pipes, and then it gets into the water. And so if you're getting water runoff from the road, what other pollutants do you think would actually be in the water besides just the litter itself? Can you think about what kind of pollution is on the street? Yeah? OK, sewage. Hopefully not very much, but yeah, there could be sewage on the street. So it will definitely add bacteria. What other pollution do you think is on the street? Has anyone here ever been in snow before? I'm not talking ski Dubai. When it snows on the road, um, one of the things they'll often do is they'll add salt to the road. Do you know why they do that? It makes it uh, melt more easily. Right, they're trying to prevent ice. And so think about a place that they put a lot of salt onto the road. Well, that salt has to go somewhere. The salt doesn't evaporate. And so it stays there until either the snow melts or there's a rainy day. And all of that salt will get into the river as well. And so the exhaust from cars, oil leaks, um, sand and gravel and grit, all of those pollutants will end up in the rivers, things from the road. Here's a picture in the UAE. Has anyone been to Hata Pools before? It's a beautiful place. Here's a picture of a lawn chair. Uh, so you never know what kind of pollution you're going to find, even in a beautiful, pristine place like Hata Pools. So I'm, I probably someone was just sitting and then fell into the water and left their chair. I, I don't know what the story is with that. but I, Huh? Maybe. Yeah, it probably was the wind. I really encourage you to go there. It's a beautiful place. It's really spectacular. Um, okay, today's in-class exercise is going to be related to measuring solids in water. So I'd like to go over some of the basics of this, and then we'll get started in the calculations. You can break solids down into different classifications. Uh, Solids are things that are left behind when the water evaporates. And so we say we put it in an oven at 103 degrees Celsius. That will evaporate the water, but it won't burn the things that are considered volatile. Here's the formula for total solids. You'll get a chance to use it here in just a moment. We can break total solids up into components. There's the dissolved and the suspended. Dissolved solids are salts. It's things that actually uh, gets absorbed into the water. And suspended solids are those little clay particles that float around, but they don't actually dissolve. That seems almost like a contradiction in terms, right? Dissolved solids? Because if it's dissolved, is it still a solid? Well, it was a solid before it was dissolved. I guess that's how to think of it. Uh, the way that you can quantify suspended solids is they will filter a certain amount of water through paper and they'll measure the the mass of the paper before they filter and after they filter and so whatever additional residue is left on the filter then they will know that is from the suspended particles and then you can take the water that goes through the filter and evaporate that and all of the solids left behind after you evaporate the filtered water that would be considered as the dissolved solids. Sometimes the uh, solids that are left behind on the little dish after you evaporate it will burn away. And so we can further break down solids into categories of volatile and fixed. 
A fixed solid is something like a rock. You, you can put a rock in an oven, but it's not going to burn away. On the other hand, organic materials like algae or coal, anything that has a carbon-hydrogen bond will burn if it's exposed to a heat of 600 degrees Celsius. And so we can break up fixed solids with this formula. And if we know total solids, subtract the volatile component from that. All right, so calculation time. In class exercise 19, we're looking at some water samples that we're going to dry in a dish for part one. And then for part two, we're going to take a look at what happens if we, uh, if we run it through a filter to try and distinguish the suspended solids from the dissolved solids. The formulas are all right there for the first part. But then for the second part, I didn't give you the formulas directly. I want you to try and think logically about what are the components of total solids. Okay, so here's the formulas on the screen. And um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to break up what's in the water. You can classify it as dissolved versus suspended. And a totally different way of classifying it is the fixed versus volatile. What do you think the word volatile means? It burns. It'll burn away. So volatile is the organic material. Fixed means it doesn't burn. Now, um, so that's fixed versus volatile. And suspended versus dissolved is looking at if it is a salt that is actually dissolved in the solution versus a, a solid particle that stays as one piece of mass that's floating around in there. Okay, so in part one, we're trying to classify total solids, 54, 75 milligrams per liter. What we have to do is change from grams to milligrams, and then from milliliters to liters. And you'll notice that when I'm doing the math, I write the units, just so I don't accidentally make the mistake. I've made the mistake so many times that I, just, I finally decided it's always worthwhile to write the units as you're doing the calculations to help avoid the mistake. So it's 54.75 milligrams per liter. Um, now when we look at part B, it's saying that residue that evaporated, which was all of the solids, is in that dish. And now we want to, to burn the dish and find out what's left behind after we burn the organics that are in the dish. So all the organic material, when you put it in the oven, it turns into a gas. And, and it just leaves probably as carbon dioxide. And what's left behind is the part that can't burn because it doesn't have carbon-hydrogen bond in it, the fixed solids. So that's, this is the residue in the numerator here. If you subtract the clean dish from it, after burning away everything, this is what it weighed. So it's the, the residue that was left after burning divided by the sample volume. And so 3850 milligrams per liter is how much fixed solids there is. That means that of the 5475, only 1625 is volatile. <coughs> okay. Now, part two is a little more tricky because I didn't give you the formula specifically. But as I was walking around, it seems like most people were figuring out how to do that. You think about the total solids is partly fixed and uh, partly volatile. Well, it's also, total solids is partly dissolved and partly suspended. And so that filter, the little filter that the water's passing through, that allows the dissolved solids to go through, but it doesn't allow the uh, fixed, uh, the suspended solids. So the suspended solids get stuck on the filter. What we're putting in the drying dish, though, is the water that passed through the filter. So that has all the salt in it still. And so this is the mass of it with the, uh, with the salt minus the clean weight. And you find out how much is dissolved and therefore how much is suspended. All right. Let's take one last look at the announcements for today. Where we're headed from here. Thursday, we'll have a quiz. Sunday, homework eight. And uh, in the back of your mind, I hope you're thinking about your research topic, starting to do some reading on it. 
and let me know if you've got any questions. I'll see you on Thursday.